So uh, for our final session this morning, it's uh, Anxieties Without Borders, the New Atlantic Security Environment. Um, of all of the issues that I think came up as we were preparing uh, this session, other than trade, this was probably the one that people in all four corners of this wider Atlantic mentioned the most often. Um, we're very lucky to have one of our longtime uh, moderators, presenters, Nick Gowing of the BBC, with us today. So, Nick, it's your show. Thank you, Craig. And uh, I think on behalf of everyone, can I thank you uh, and all your friends in Morocco here for what you've organized and uh, managing to get us here uh, and also for the richness of discussion so far. And my job is to make sure that the next uh, one hour and five minutes lunch will be a little delayed, uh, will be as rich as we've heard already. For me, the highlight already uh, is Robin when she asked for the next generation, the younger generation, in the I generation discussion at 8.30. I put my hand up and she came immediately to me. So I feel that's the great achievement of coming to Rabat. So thank you, Robin. Uh, you've made my day. Anxieties without borders. Let me tell you before I introduce the session, I'm going to encourage you to use this or whatever you have, smartphone, iPhone, uh, tablet, whatever, and I'm not going to talk about particular brands. It could be that while you're listening to uh, the interventions from the floor, from the panel, you might want to contribute. Um, and I would encourage you, if you want to use email, I'm going to give you an address now, which is my own personal Gmail account, only for conferences, so don't send me any other emails through the year. It's Nick Conference, that's N-I-K Conference, then number one at gmail.com. I'll say it again, nickconference1 at gmail.com. Because sometimes when we're getting interventions, you might say, I want to make that point now rather than in half an hour. And so that's one way in which I can input it into the discussion uh, at a timely moment rather than waiting for hands to go up later. Nickconference, N-I-K, conference1 at gmail.com. But don't send me other emails about social engagements, about which plane are you taking home, would you like to meet afterwards? I just want to have only ideas for this um, session. Anxieties without borders, about where the borders end now for nation states. There's a lot on the agenda for the next hour about the potency of threats that transcend national borders placing a premium on multinational responses. And that's what we want to get to, whether it be criminal and extremist networks, whether it be AQ, whether it be insurgents, but the shifting trends. And I made this point uh, at the beginning of the I generation a discussion. What you heard then in that first hour really uh, extends into what we're going to talk about today, about the empowerment that there is right across so many areas, so many communities. What value are national borders now, whether in Africa or in North and South America, or, or elsewhere. We want to uh, address the successes and limitations of current approaches, and what everyone is fearing at the moment about the need to rethink understanding of these environments, but also how reactive are policymakers and those who are planning, but how prescriptive and forward-looking can they be about what is inevitable in this uh, new environment. So uh, that is where we want to get to, whether it be drugs trafficking, instability in the Sahel, uh, AQ foreign fighters, insurgencies, borders, uh, and how you police those within sovereign imperatives, but realizing there are other things going on out there. Now let me um, introduce the panel, because you'll notice one person is missing. You're expecting to see Michael Chertoff. Um, he uh, was on a plane, or get, due to get on a plane, which went technical, so he wasn't able to arrive. So we have uh, Artis Pabriks, who is Defence Minister of Latvia. Welcome. And uh, he reminded me that 20 years ago, he was on the streets in Latvia against the Soviet control, and he confided to me a moment ago, he's still amazed that he's having cigar and whiskey or whatever he has with the generals and defense ministers of NATO in Brussels and elsewhere. So welcome. And uh, we can't offer you cigars in, in this session, but I hope you'll enjoy a Moroccan <laughs> cigar later. Secondly uh, uh, is Carter Ham, general uh, commander of uh, US Africa Command, normally based in Stuttgart, but probably has as many frequent flyer miles as most people, if not more, just traveling through Africa. So welcome. And um, 
he was enlisted, and I did check this with him. He's the only serving member of the US Armed Forces uh, who has gone from green to gold and is serving. In other words, uh, he uh, has gone from the bottom to the top, and uh, that's a remarkable thing, particularly because he was enlisted. Thirdly, um, Khalid Zarali, Director of Migration and Border Control for the Ministry of the Interior here in the Kingdom of Morocco, uh, welcome. And uh, finally, uh, Arturo Sarakan, who is ambassador to the United States for Mexico. He's actually got something else on his mind at the moment. He was um, uh, brought up in North Wales, and we've been, just been talking about where, Liv where Liverpool are playing today, which is at Norwich. So if he keeps looking at his BlackBerry, it's because he's worried about the football score uh, for Liverpool. Welcome to you all. Now let's move forward, because I'd like uh, General Ham to, for you to specify where you see these anxieties, particularly in Africa, but also more broadly across the Atlantic, um, which are transcending borders. Very much, Nick. It, uh, there's lots of anxiety for me today. One is, as I look around, not a lot of military uniforms in this audience. Uh, so that causes a bit of anxiety. But I will tell you that, uh, that coming here has been a great opportunity to listen and learn uh, 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 from those who have studied and thought long and hard about the, the, uh, the security issues in the, in the region. So it's been very helpful. I'm a little anxious because my ambassador is sitting right here the ambassador to the, uh, from the United States to, to the Kingdom of Morocco, uh, so he'll critique me after this. Uh, but mostly I think I'm anxious because of the, the topic, and I think it's a timely topic uh, to talk about these uh, transnational, cross-border, interdimensional uh, issues that we have to, uh, to contend with. So perhaps to begin what I hope will be a conversation, let me identify a couple of the uh, transnational, regional, cross-border issues that we're currently contending with. And let me start in a place that might seem a little bit odd for a conference that's focused on the Atlantic, and that's in Somalia. We don't often think about Somalia being much of an area of, of Atlantic security interest, but when you look at the, the, who's involved there, uh, there is a, uh, the issue of economic interest affected by piracy, the European Union and many others are, are engaged there, uh, certainly uh, a broader regional issue. And then as was raised earlier in one of the uh, sessions this morning, the whole, the whole idea, the impact of the diaspora and what impact that plays. And there is, of course, a large Somali diaspora in Europe and in the United States that has an effect. Secondly, I'd go to the other coast, uh, to the Gulf of Guinea. Again, a, an area where piracy, but piracy in a different dimension affects uh, Atlantic security and, and Atlantic econo uh, economic activity, both east and west and north and, and south. And as we heard yesterday, again, the Brazilian Navy, for example, uh, participating in maritime security activities in the Gulf of Guinea, I think uh, indicates the Atlantic nature uh, of this. And there is certainly a continuing issue uh, of the post-colonial European influence in that region and how that is unfolding and continues to affect uh, matters today. So again, I think a, a significant transnational uh, and Atlantic connection. In Libya, to be sure, uh, we've seen the events of the past few weeks unfold, uh, and I think Nick will talk about this and the effect of social media. In Libya, again, at the connecting point of several different cultures, partly Arab, partly African, certainly Mediterranean, uh, and the effects there and how that might, uh, might influence all of us. Uh, in Mali, a major uh, security focus for all of us, uh, broader transnational uh, issues where uh, violent extremist, extremism has taken root, uh, essentially operating from safe haven, which threatens, again, not only the region, but the broader uh, uh, global effect as well, particularly into Europe and, of course, the U.S. is concerned. And finally, in Nigeria, uh, where Boko Haram and others uh, create a threat. While each individually is concerned, it is, to me, the connected nature of all those different uh, entities and, and activities that pose the greatest concern for us as we look to the future. So trans, uh, transnational or anxieties across borders are easy to identify as we discussed last night, there are also tremendous uh, uh, transnational, regional opportunities. Those are harder to identify than are the challenges. General, just, 
just before I pass on, uh, can you just specify, you were sitting at the, <clears throat> at the, the back of the, the I-Generation discussion earlier, how much that is changing the whole <clears throat> landscape of what you're trying to analyze simply because of the level of connectivity uh, which can be achieved by those who might be creating these threats? It, it's, uh, it, it is, I think, again, Nick, very much both a, a, a challenge and, a, and an opportunity. As we heard, there are some governments who are repressing and controlling uh, access to social media. That, that, that may work in the short term, will not work in the long term. It cannot uh, be adequately controlled, I think. Um, I, I do worry, as some mentioned, there, were, there, there are great ideas that are proliferated <laughs> through social media. I worry sometimes that the good ideas get lost by those who have the loudest ideas. And I think that's something we have to be uh, conscious of. Um, the penetration and use of social media uh, is not unlike the map that we saw last night that showed where electrical power is across the continent of Africa. Uh, but but uh, SMS text messaging and other activity is quickly in, uh, expanding across the continent and governments organizations, militaries, to be sure, uh, and civil society will have to uh, adapt how they do business because of this. But just very quickly, it is therefore reframing the way you define these anxieties and very quickly. Um, it, it, it does because it is, it, the, the flow of information is so much more rapid and so much less hierarchical than it has been before. Thank you, General. Could I remind you, NIK Conference 1 at Gmail, if you want to come back on any points, don't send me <coughs> along um, several pages, just a couple of lines would be great. But uh, let me encourage you to do that so I can pick up uh, on other, other points which are on your mind. Minister, let me come to you next. Uh, your view both from the Baltics, but also what you see in NATO, we're out of area here, but certainly the anxieties go way, way beyond whether it be your country or NATO. Well, uh, first, hello, and I was uh, reminded by organizers that I, if I can't be brilliant, I at least have to be short. And that reminded me of one of the Japanese sayings that uh, politeness, this is compulsory, brain optional. I'll try to be at least short in, in my remarks. Um, about anxiety, so I would say uh, limitless fear, because borders are always existing, they're just changing. And uh, looking from our region uh, to what is happening in the world, how regimes quickly changed in uh, so-called Arab Spring revolutions, I think that we are approaching the age where um, we cannot speak anymore uh, about some kind of limits of internet freedoms, unfortunately, looking from my perspective, because uh, 20 years ago, I was the one who wanted to make a revolution. I did not have social media at that time at my hand. If I would have, I would use it very much. But today, in my position, I really have to uh, defend those uh, freedoms, uh, values, on what my society and my country is built. So that, that makes me look a little bit different to these issues. And, uh, uh, and those challenges uh, to, uh, to, to, to our societies or our countries, they're obviously hybrid. They're not anymore directly military, uh, at least in most of cases, which means that there is not countries in war or armies in war, as we usually expect, but there are societies at war, there are NGOs at war, or there are so-called governmental organizations or gongos at war with each other. So how do we find a border between these things, and what is a state response? And uh, usually we are extremely, and sorry to be a little bit challenging, but we are very happy frequently about, uh, let's say, these social revolutions when young people like me 20 years ago are coming on the streets and turning around tear tyrannies and, and uh, trying to speak about democracy. But we forget frequently that social media um, is very helpful to uh, sack any kind of regime, also actually democratic regime, but can it help to create a new stable regime, and we still do not have an answer for that. And then another question is about connections um, between the active warfare or political interests, political violence, and the position of media or influences of media. Because if you look, if you look to even 
20th century biggest wars. Germany started with Poland, 39. It started with media warfare. Uh, Soviet Union started against the Finland in 39. It was media warfare first, at least preparation of grounds. If we're looking now, 2008, it was Russian-Georgian war. I don't know who won in this media network, but, but it was active. Now with Taliban, with all these um, uh, films what we see on Yahoo uh, or, or YouTube, uh, obviously, 50 years ago, people would even not know what some, sorry to say, um, activist in United States filmed and what does he think about prophet or what does he think about Jesus. Now everybody knows that or at least tend to know. And then the question is, who is using this information? Is it just information for the sake of information or this is information with some concrete target, with some concrete goal? And uh, I think that in this hybrid um, uh, anxieties of warfare, uh, media is having a huge responsibility and people who are informed now much more than maybe 10, 20, 30 years ago uh, are also has to be more responsible about their activities because information by itself doesn't mean immediately that you have uh, more qualifications. How well do you think the political class, your fellow polit political leaders, can understand the speed? How much are they able to frame their behavior uh, and their response in a timely way to the enormity of the change? Well, you see, politicians uh, usually tend to work like uh, um, uh, firemen. They do not think forward very much because for many reasons they do not have time for this. And we are now made aware very much of cyber threats. But at this moment, I think that these cyber threats in many places are joining with these new challenges what new social media is proposing. They're basically intertwined. And I think that politicians, just like frequently technicians, they actually do not have a good answer because we are kind of behind those activities and we are not controlling the situation. But do they at least have an appreciation of the enormity of what is happening and the speed at which it's changing? Uh, well, uh, I heard also today in the morning uh, this discussion that politicians in many regions are not involved in social, in social media. At least in my region, uh, we are quite a bit involved. We are trying to answer, we are trying to be in contact. But on the other hand, uh, you know, it is also sometimes distracting you from real work because it's not only something to type, you know, in, in five words and, and to be on the scene, but you sometimes have to think too. So I'm not sure that, let's say, I'm, I'm almost sure that the dark side of social media is sometimes also surface thinking. I'm pressing that and I'd like that to underpin your, your consideration as well because of the new vulnerabilities of power that this is, mm. this is highlighting. If there are new anxieties, the speed at which there can be at least a, uh, analysis of what's happening and uh, an ability to mitigate what's happening and maybe act against it. Um, let me move on now to Khalid Durali, uh, Director of Migration and Border Controls uh, here in Morocco. And here you have a number of very serious challenges on your borders. Uh, what are your anxieties here, particularly because of the way they're developing so fast? Well, I think the uh, principle of indivisibility of security should be, should be taken into account because uh, border surveillance is not a matter of only one country's uh, task. It should be a global, global effort. What we see in, uh, in our region, in the Sahel, mainly in the Sahel and Sahara region, is uh, that TUC, uh, transnational organized crime, and terrorism have become uh, two faces of the same coin. It has been difficult today to distinguish between uh, the smuggler, the terrorist, uh, and the mob. Uh, now TOC is playing another role. It's connecting uh, terrorist groups like Boko Haram with uh, Akim or Akim with Shabab in Somalia. Uh, and lately we see that TOC is connecting two continents. It's connecting the narco cartels in Latin America with West Africa. West Africa has become a logistics platform for, uh, for cocaine. Uh, so we, 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 should, we should tackle the TOC in another, I would say, analysis matrix that goes beyond the classic uh, analysis matrix that we used to do. There is no more distinction between terrorism and, uh, and TOC. Uh, the connection between the narco cartels in Latin America and West Africa, there was a promotion of what we call uh, narco-terrorism, which 
I would say, almost failed in, uh, in, in Guinea years ago. Now there is, uh, we, feel, we feel that there is a grand strategy uh, that promotes uh, the creation or the setting up of uh, criminal states, which means that uh, through money laundering, uh, investments are made in uh, some weak countries, jobs are created, and there is a, a, an intention to infiltrate in a democratic way, I would say, uh, the bodies of the governments of, of, of failed states or weak states, which means that uh, TOC slash terrorism uh, terrorist uh, players uh, try to shift from a non-state actors to state actors. And I think at the strategic level, this is something that we should bear in mind and we should work together to, 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 to implement the principle of shared responsibility. It's not only a matter of, uh, of, of, of having sealed off borders, it should be a bilateral, uh, regional, but also international effort to combat this collective threat that is being posed to, to us today. What about your capacity as a state to track this, to monitor it, I can and, give to, you and to create countermeasures as a result? I, I, can, I can give you figures. We, uh, maybe we are the only country in the region that has a coherent policy in terms of sealing of the borders. Uh, years ago, uh, I, I give you, for instance, for migration, illegal migration. Today we have uh, compressed the level of illegal aliens that go through Morocco to Europe by 91% during the five, the five years. Uh, likewise for the drug, drug trafficking. We felt that uh, there was uh, a push strategy from the cartels in Latin America to, go to, to have cocaine going through Morocco in 2007, and we cracked down on, uh, on, on networks. Not only that, but uh, uh, even uh, uh, Al-Qaeda, for instance, Al-Qaeda, just after 9-11, was targeting a Gibraltar Strait and mainly American ships that go through the, the Gibraltar. And we have dismantled uh, a sleeping cell back, back then that was targeting uh, the maritime border, I would say. So uh, maybe we can be, uh, Morocco can be proud to be a leader in the region in terms of sealing of the borders. We have, of course, a strategy that, uh, that is based on technology, but also on physical presence on the borders. Are they often smarter than you? Uh, I think that so far we are outperforming them, simply because uh, Morocco is the exception in terms of uh, uh, the attempts of uh, some terrorist groups to infiltrate the national territory. So we, we can be proud to have so far a good strategy in terms of sealing of the, the borders. All right, well, let me move on to Arturo Sarakan. Uh, please, General, yes. Yes, Please so do, I, yes. So I, so it's a I conversation. Um, to, to your point, your question, are they smarter? No, they're not. Uh, but they are more agile uh, because they, are, they obviously are not confined, operating under the rule of law. And, uh, and they don't have to deal with Congress. And, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Ambassador, you can say that. Uh, but but we, we, are, we are bureaucracies. They're not. They're very flat. They're very, uh, they're very adaptive. Uh, yeah, but, uh, and they're not publicly accountable. But also, I think uh, the financial crisis today makes that governments uh, can no longer afford to, to make investments in terms of uh, acquiring technology and equipment for border surveillance. Whereas TOC is flourishing today. Uh, I was reading a report uh, year, uh, two days ago about arms trafficking. It's, 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 it's booming up. So TOC is generating a lot of cash and they're investing. We've seen uh, uh, semi-submersible vehicles being used. We've seen even attempts to, to acquire uh, submarines. Uh, we've seen operations in which uh, aircraft and, uh, and, and ships are used. So these guys are having and acquiring more and more uh, resources. Is it about money, though? I mean, not everything costs a lot of money these days. Uh, it still generates a lot of money. Anyway, they're making no, the more cost money. Of countermeasures. They're, they're making more money than, than some countries in the All region. Right. All right. Arturo Sarakan, let me turn to you now, uh, particularly with your experience on counter-narcotics. I thought you were going to ask a question there. Um, no, it's, it's your opening look, remarks. Look, um, I, I, I think there are two, at least in terms of the Mexico-US border, but then I'll extrapolate to some of the more international transatlantic challenges that we face. In regards to the obvious importance of the US-Mexico relationship and the border, there are two distinct challenges. One is how you 
develop a membrane approach to border security. Not a fence, not a wall. Because you need to take on the challenge of ensuring prosperity and security when you think that we've got a $1 billion plus trade flow per day going back and forth across our border with the United States. You need to ensure that, yes, as you thicken security and as you enhance security, you don't clog down that $1 billion of trade that go back and forth every single day. So the first challenge is, as you enhance border security, as you provide intellig in intelligent security measures, how do you continue to provide for those flows of good, licit flows of goods and services? The other one, in terms of the challenge that we face confronting transnational organized crime, is how, how do you continue to work to ensure that security on the border is deepened and enhanced? I think that at the end of the day, if you're really prodding us as you were back there to think about the anxieties, uh, yes, there is the challenge of transnational organized crime plying its trade in both directions, guns and cash in one direction, bulk cash, drugs in the other. Um, but the real problem for countries, especially, and I'm thinking of Canada and Mexico, post 9-11, is that the advantages that borders provide TCOs are used by potential terrorist groups to undermine our security. That's the big nightmare. That's the big challenge that we face. How do we ensure that all the stuff that we've been doing post 9-11 can prevent a potential terrorist attack? Um, I think there are commonalities across the Atlantic. Uh, one of them, obviously, is how transnational criminal organizations are diversifying their trade. I've said this. Uh, certain Texas newspapers hate my guts for saying this, but these guys are businessmen. They work like businesses. They do hostile takeovers and mergers and acquisitions. As we've, uh, as we've constrained their ability to use the traditional uh, channels of drugs coming from South America into the North American market, they do what other companies do. They, 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 they muscle their way into other illicit activities, human trafficking, uh, paramount among them. And so we have to think holistically about how we look at and deal with organized crime. Money flows, money laundering, it's a critical challenge across the Atlantic Basin. How the money that comes back into the system provides these groups with the ability to corrupt, buy equipment, be more nimble than governments are. And then finally, another issue that I think, if you look at the Atlantic Basin as a whole, some countries are still woefully inadequate to confront, which is cybersecurity, and at the same time, how the bad actors in the system are using the same technology that we were talking about a few minutes ago, which is used to mobilize civil society or to, uh, uh, to foster open societies. How do we take on those opportunities that these same platforms and these same technologies provide to organize crime? How does a company that provides a social media platform, do the, are they co-responsible in any way in ensuring that, for example, drug syndicates don't put up their postings on the web to intimidate rival gangs and create terror. How, how do we confront the use of these uh, platforms by organized crime, for example, I think is a very relevant issue. There's an int already uh, quite a few people have started putting ideas. Let me put one from Maricha Shaka from the European Parliament, saying that actually there's a positive side to this. How to ensure these opportunities are fostered and not smothered by choosing security and control over freedom and empowerment of individuals. This dilemma, General. It, it, it's very much the issue of getting the right balance. Um, uh, and I think for, for many of the challenges that we've spoken of the, this morning, uh, there, there, is a, there is a military dimension, a security dimension to this. But I would argue that in, in almost every case, uh, that the military or security is, is a, an essential but non-decisive component of dealing with these, uh, with these challenges. We, we don't ever want to get into a position where, where, where we're re repressing uh, the, the same principles that we're all trying to espouse as these, as these uh, revolutions, these newly emerging democracies uh, try to get their feet under them. They do need a security environment to do that, but if they, if they only do that by repressing dialogue, by repressing freedom of expression, 
that, that's not going to be long standing. It's not a solid base upon which to build. Because traditionally, of course, you'd monitor through, through uh, national technical means and so on what's going on when there is an anxiety. You might use PSYOPs or information operations. Is there a new way forward, just picking up on this point from the European Parliament, from Marita, is there a new way forward to engage which doesn't necessarily involve some kind of conflictual relationship to resolve this anxiety? Well, we have a wide variety of means, obviously, to, to try to better understand the security environment in, in, in which we are all operating. This conference is, is one of them, oh, by the way, to get a better understanding of all those issues. Um, but the, the proliferation of social media does afford us the opportunity, we and host nation governments, to, to get their word out, uh, to, to, to engage in the dialogue with those uh, in, 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 the, in the social media space. Well, uh, in my opinion, the, main, the, the, the most important response that we can oppose to, to this is to go beyond, to transcend the security approach. We have to have a global approach. We have to act on vulnerabilities. We have to work with youth. We have to show uh, that uh, we, we, there is a solidarity worldwide to cope with vulnerabilities that uh, many African countries today uh, suffer from. That's exactly what TOC is trying to do. The TOC today is investing in many countries. They're money laundering, but at the same time, they're creating jobs. They're trying to fulfill the basic needs of the populations. So we, we will see, if we do not act as states, we will see uh, the emergence of new states, but they are infiltrated by TOC uh, players. So uh, beyond the security approach, we have to think about a global approach, how to cope with vulnerabilities, how to work with education, how to help e economically, how to help countries to enhance their capabilities in terms of, uh, of security and so on. So the global approach will be, will be the right response. Minister. Yeah, well, what borders are for? Uh, if we are looking from this security perspective, I think one of the examples we can really analyze is Schengen. Because on the one hand, every country was thinking that, okay, we have our national border, we try to limit, let's say, fear, we try to limit some threats, and this is how we act. And once we deconstructed, in that sense, borders in Europe, we had to immediately interact between the governments, between the offices, and between the civil society also in a different way. And I think that is a part of the answer to those threats, because if you have transborder or... Uh, uh, Yes, transborder threats or uh, anxieties across the border. Obviously, the answer should be also transborder. You cannot answer these questions nationally. But this is what usually people try to do, because as soon as something is threatening them, either it's economic dangers or uh, terrorism or ideology or, or media or something like this, they try to close the border. This is the wrong answer. You, you have to open the border with the uh, idea of cooperation. I don't see a much better idea at this moment. Ambassador. Well, I, I think that the, the, the question at hand um, refers mo much more to the challenges that two of my colleagues face on this side of the Southern Atlantic than what is happening on, on our side in the Western Hemisphere. I think in the Western Hemisphere, hemisphere the, the dichotomy is between really bad actors, I mean organized crime, using these tools, because I don't think with the exception possibly of one country in the Western Hemisphere, that the challenge of an open society versus how the government uh, prevents uh, the bad use of these platforms is, is, isn't an issue. I think for us, really, again, it's about how the Googles and the Facebooks and the Twitters of the world prevent those bad actors from using those same tools uh, to conduct their business or to intimidate or to um, uh, push back against rival gangs. That is the big challenge. So I, I don't see the dichotomy between o open and closed, open societies and the government trying to shut that down in the Western Hemisphere. A particular question for you here from uh, Craig Kelly, General, um, particularly about uh, energy supplies, security of energy supplies, ships, pipelines, etc., right around the Atlantic Basin. How much do you see this as a major anxiety across borders at the moment? Uh, I don't think it's, it, it's not an, an imminent threat, but it certainly is on the minds of the maritime nations of, of Africa, and we work very closely with them uh, to try to build uh, adequate uh, maritime protections. And this is a great area where, where uh, re a regional approach is really necessary because of operating in the, the maritime domain. 
it, it involves uh, so many different nations. So I agree it's an it's a issue, not imminent threat, but certainly one that's, that's understood in its importance. Are you getting that level of agreement that you need to, to take it on, to challenge, to be ready for it? Well, it's mixed, uh, as all things are. But as one example, uh, through the good offices of the African Union, there's been some truly groundbreaking work between the two regional economic communities, ECOWAS and, and SEAC, uh, to formulate uh, uh, information sharing, uh, 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 cross-border operations, police information sharing in the maritime domain that uh, I think is very promising. Can I just check from the Moroccan point of view, how do you see this, given uh, the vital nature of energy supplies to you and your role in this? Well, uh, I think uh, Al-Qaeda, at least the, the actual ter uh, terrorist uh, group that uh, threatens everybody, so far did not succeed to launch maritime operations. Uh, why do you think maybe, that is? Maybe... What's your assessment of why that hasn't happened? I think it's just a matter of time. Uh, it's just like what happened in the desert of Algeria when uh, the Salafist group in Algeria uh, oriented its action towards the desert because there was an interaction between smugglers and uh, the, uh, the, the, the Salafist group and they convinced them to operate in the desert because there was a lot of potential over there. But uh, so far, except the attack on USS Cole, the Sylvan, and maybe the Limburg, uh, I'm not talking about piracy, I'm just talking about direct uh, attacks. I think so far, Al-Qaeda does not have a, a strong foothold in the maritime domain. However, we know that Al-Qaeda is uh, placing a maritime domain as its priorities because Bin Laden himself uh, vowed for disrupting the international trade and attacking maritime roads. So we have to be vigilant, we have to go uh, more in terms of cooperation. As I was saying, some African countries today do not have the means to safeguard the terrestrial borders. Maritime borders are even costly. So, again, I insist on the necessity to implement the principle of shared responsibility. It's not because it's happening in Africa that will not impact uh, the other uh, uh, places in the world. So we need to think more about how to create mechanisms of intelligence sharing, uh, how to create mechanisms in terms of uh, surveillance, joint operations in the maritime domain. We do it with our neighbors, but we think that it is time to think about a, an initiative to work in the South uh, Atlantic, because uh, things are getting more and more serious, and Al-Qaeda one day will definitely hit one of the strategic routes in the maritime domain. General Ham, can you give us uh you're on the record here, any, any just response to that? AQ may not have that capacity, but not having a capacity surely isn't a, a, a valid planning assumption. Is it something you're concerned about? Uh, certainly. I mean, the, the, uh, um, the, the expert has spoken. I mean, this is the, guy, the, the man who watches this on a daily basis. Uh, so it certainly is of, of concern. And I'm, I'm very satisfied that the, uh, that the African maritime states uh, recognize the, the, the potential threat there and are seeking collectively to address that. All right, a lot of questions coming in. I will allow you to use a microphone, but let me, it's a great way of getting a lot of things onto the agenda very uh, time efficiently. Uh, Minister, a, a point here from Michal Baranowski uh, about uh, Latvia, Estonia just being named by Freedom House as number one in terms of freedom of the net. Question, is being plugged in making the country more resilient or more vulnerable? Well, it depends who, who plugs in. Hmm. But um, I would say that uh, dangers uh, are increasing, particularly to, if I'm looking to my region, then uh, of course our countries are very vulnerable in the sense that we are small ones and we do not have such financial resources. But at the same time, knowing that in our region is also NATO cyber centers, that helps quite a bit. So I would say that. Uh, being honest, we are a little bit behind the technological developments in the world, but we are not very much behind. But, but technologies are developing faster than the state responses. 
All right, there are two questions which come together to make a very important point. First of all, from Khaled Ben Hamu, within the context of the Arab Spring, how vulnerable are current political establishments to TOCs, TCOs in the region? What new measures need to be looked at? And another one from Jeremy Lester, traditional power is state-bound at the moment, new threats and opportunities are not. How to have dem democratically controlled international response, given the scale of what you're outlining? Would you like to come in, Ambassador, on this one? Yeah, I, I, I think that that's the, as, as we think of transnational securities in the Atlantic, that, that is increasingly the template. It, I, I don't foresee certainly any state on state um, actions, but it's non state actors and how we take on non state actors. In many ways, instead of being transnational, it should be trans state security challenges. Um, I, think, I think the key lies in some of the things that we've already been doing with our North American neighbors and with some of our European colleagues, which is to enhance uh, intelligence sharing and to uh, change the way we go about sharing intelligence because uh, increasingly these challenges, which are global in nature, uh, I'll give you an example, um, and it's public, so I, I'm not breaking any diplomatic or security protocols here, but um, several months back we worked with our U.S. colleagues, uh, one of them in this room, uh, because we, we in Mexico were able to detect that one of Gaddafi's sons had engaged in a Canadian, with a Canadian company, with a U.S. aviation general, uh, general aviation company and Mexican forges to leave Libya, fly to Kosovo, fly to Las Ores, then Cozumel, and pretend to be a Mexican living in exile in Puerto Vallarta. <laughs> and the way we work, not only to identify, get the intelligence, allow the operation to continue until we were ready to nip it at the bud, tells you some of the ways that we have to start thinking of some of these trans-state, transnational security challenges that we're facing across the Atlantic. Another one is, again, for, for those uh, in the audience who know the United States well or Americans, you'll understand when I, when I use the phrase whack-a-mole. Um, for, for others, it's like pressing, squeezing a water-filled balloon. Uh, some of the stuff that we've been doing in confronting transnational criminal organizations, especially those related to drugs, is that in part because of the success that Mexico and the United States have had in diverting trafficking routes of cocaine coming from South America into the United States, which is still the largest consumer market of cocaine. It's not the, it's not the, uh, the wealthiest. The wealthiest is, uh, the, the most lucrative is in, in Western Europe today. And, and, um, but one of the effects is that now you're having trafficking routes coming out into the Caribbean, basically the DR and Haiti. From there, they're coming into Western Africa, and then from there, they're coming into the United States, and into Western Europe. The big challenge, which we don't have so far in the Western Hemisphere, is that, oh, by the way, in Western Africa, you have the juxtaposition of fundamentalist terrorist groups. And so the profits are feeding into potential terrorist organizations. Give me an audit quickly of where you see the level of cooperation, where you see the resistance, the obstacles at the moment. Is it political? Is, is it institutional? What is it? Or is it actually a, a fair wind which is moving in that direction? I, I, I think the trend is moving in the right direction. I think what has to be done, though? I think it, you have to break down bureaucratic resistance. Is uh, it bureaucratic or, or political? I think it's much more bureaucratic. <laughs> I think certainly the political willingness increasingly seems to be there but you're, you're dealing with agencies that either, because they work in stove pipes, forget about with other agencies in other countries. Within the US or the Mexico bureaucracies, which I know very well, it's sometimes hard to get those bureaucracies within one single government to share and to work in, in coordination. Because, of course, you made a side remark to when the general and you said, said something, and you said, well, it depends on Congress. Um, let, me, let me go to the, the minister. Just picking up on Jeremy Lester's point, how to have democratically controlled that international response. Where do you see the resistances, uh, both from your national position and also, say, the NATO or Sorry, European Union? Sorry, did not understand. How to have democratically controlled international response to the scale of what you're laying out here? Well, if I would have a good answer, that would be very good, because yesterday I was listening, actually, our neighboring country's uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov in United Nations. And one of the sentences, among different others, uh, sometimes contradictory in my view, he was mentioning that international organizations uh, and international society cannot uh, fully respond to the new challenges that we have now. And I think that is the biggest problem. It's not 
just a question about democracy or not democracy. It's a question, can the governments or state institutions really grasp and find the ways enough efficient and quick how to uh, answer those threats. And I don't think we do have a good answer to this. We don't have a good answer because if we are sticking to existing framework, it's either getting too late or too long or never. General, what can you share with us about the resistances you feel when you make a security assessment about the issues we're discussing? You keep pushing it up through the system, but keep then perhaps hitting walls of some kind or ceilings of some kind. I, I would agree with the assessment that, that most of the impediments to greater regional or, or international cooperation are institutional uh, vice political. I, I sense actually in, in Africa a wide consensus on how to deal with a number of these security issues, uh, but what's lacking are the, the, the mechanisms, the processes uh, for the international community for individual states uh, to work collectively toward common purpose, and that's something I think can be improved upon. Let's get the microphones out. We've got three or four. Who would like to come in, please, here? Just make sure the microphone comes to you. I, I've got my back to you rather impolitely, but make sure the microphone's here. We've got about 20 minutes to run, so I don't have a lot of time, but just while the microphones are moving, get the microphone to somebody else, can you? Um, one question here from Jennifer Nero, just picking up, Ambassador, on what you're saying about the Caribbean. Can anyone on the panel share what is happening in the international security arrangements to discourage the unfortunate flow of drug trafficking through these defenseless islands? Um, in many ways, the challenge that we see in Central America and the Caribbean is that they've become victims to our success in North America. And it's a big challenge. I think we have to develop a a co-responsible holistic framework because if not some of these, if Mexico has had institutional challenges, imagine what these challenges look like in certain parts of the Caribbean or Central America. Um, I think the biggest challenge for those nations, uh, given what's happening today, is the laundering of money, regardless of the trafficking patterns, which, which obviously put a lot of strain on uh, national capabilities, institutional capabilities. I think the, the issue of money laundering the patterns of money laundering, whether it's smurfing through the banking system or it's bulk cash trafficking, which increasingly is, is the response where those countries have developed the, the institutions and the abilities to prevent formal laundering through the banking system, bulk cash trafficking has become a huge problem. Um, I, I'll be very frank, even though uh, there have been some multilateral approaches to try and deal with this, at the Caribbean, at the sub-regional level in the Caribbean and Central America, I think that the formal multilateral institutions that exist today in the region are completely hapless to take these challenges on. I think we have to develop a new template for multilateral cooperation beyond what 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 you're doing through the OAS or other multilateral sub-regional institutions. Because Jennifer goes on to say, this is splintering the fabric of our otherwise peaceful Caribbean community. Absolutely. That's tough language to use. Absolutely. I think when uh, international cooperation does not work, uh, I think it, it's mainly because there is no common comprehension of the threat. Sometimes we, we do not uh, evaluate uh, the same way the threat that, uh, that is being posed. Uh, should it be terrorism or, or narcotics? Now for drugs. For drugs, sometimes we focus on uh, combating trafficking. In Morocco, we have a global approach. You have, to apply, you have to apply an action on supply, trafficking, but also consumption, if you want to really cope with, uh, with drug trafficking. So it's not a matter of combating cocaine in the Caribbean or in, uh, in Latin America, but you have to work all the way the chain, supply, trafficking, but also demand, uh, consumption. Uh, we are facing today uh, a dichotomy in, in the language. For instance, for, for the marijuana or for the hashish. Some countries even legalize the consumption of, uh, of, of the hashish. So that means you have a big market, huge demand, and at the same time, everybody is focusing on trafficking. So supply, trafficking, and consumption is the right answer. I want to get as many questions in right at the back. Thank you. Tamara Wittes from the Saban Center at Brookings. I was fascinated to hear from a number of you the relationships that you see between the security challenges that you're confronting on the one hand and development, open society, open media, civil society as tools in confronting those security challenges. Um, 
I'm, I'm wondering if you could address, and, and perhaps I'll direct this to General Hamm in particular, it seems to me there are two key challenges that we face in implementing the insight uh, that you have into this issue. Number one is that our military to military and intel to intel ways of working these security issues often don't give us scope for talking about good governance or corruption or development. Uh, so is, how can we broaden that mill-mill or security channel to encompass these issues? Secondly, very briefly, we heard last night from a number of folks that there's reticence among a number of rising powers, Brazil in particular, uh, was discussed last night, to think of democracy as a core common value uh, underlying these relationships. How do we overcome that kind of resistance? Do please, if you want to send a one-liner or two-liner to me at Nick Conference 1, please do so. Can I just build on that? Because um, a little earlier, uh, Emily Mybra, the first point there, uh, an attorney from Johannesburg in this room, closing borders, increasing censorship in whatever way it's done, is usually a sign that a country or government is losing the battle. South Africa's infamous Protection of Information Bill is an example of a knee-jerk reaction from an anxious government that has lost its legitimacy. That's a comment at the end. Who'd like to come in on this, particularly that? Well, I think actually that this is already a, a too late response because in uh, social media today or tomorrow or media network uh, today and tomorrow, national borders do not play anymore the role. I don't think you can anymore control somebody who is establishing some kind of a station or something else outside your national borders. What would you do? So I, I, I think that the response really is, is clear that this uh, nation or country is losing, but uh, this response will not help them. General. Um, I, well, I think that's true. The, the minister is correct. You, governments can control or other entities can control access for very limited period of times in very limited uh, geographic space, but you can't uh, control it uh, for a long time. The technology is just, just doesn't uh, allow that to happen. So I think those who try to control, to dominate social media, that's probably energy that could be spent more productively in, in other areas. If, if I may, Nick, just briefly on the comment of the, the interconnected nature between security development uh, and, and good governance. It's very clearly that we see that. Um, we, we, in our typical military fashion, we, we uh, 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 condense that to, a, to 3D, uh, defense, diplomacy, and development. And, and any one of them by themselves will not be successful. It is the, it is the, the three done in conjunction uh, that can help move things forward. The perspective from Mexico, given the enormity of the challenges on, on several fronts, but particularly that, that issue. I, I, I that. don't think there's, for us, I don't think there's a dilemma or a conundrum. Again, the challenge that we face isn't about how do we prevent society from using these tools, it's how do we prevent the bad guys from taking advantage you have an of, answer? Of, of these platforms. No, I don't. I was the first, I'm, I'm the first accredited ambassador to start tweeting so I fully believe in the power of these tools to push and to uh, get uh, public policy out there. It, it, the only answer that I would have is some of the stuff that we've already started doing with some of these platform providers. I'll give you another example. Google, we've been working with Google to provide citizens of Ciudad Juarez with a tool to send in information to the police. And so they can do it with SMS with a propriety software that is being developed so when they send in, oh, I think there's a drug deal going down in my neighbor's house, that that software doesn't provide who sent it from which telephone number, so there's absolute anonymity in sending that in and then raising the incentives for society to become a co-stateholder in taking on organized crime. And you don't create new anxieties in Mexico about you tweeting? Um, I certainly hope not, but if I do, Bad luck because if you have to send a 140 character tweet to Mexico City for approval, then the tool doesn't work. And you always spell correctly. But the, I the, try. Uh, the position here in Morocco, given that you have immense challenges, not least on the social media, but also the freedom of information. Yeah, I think, uh, I think the virtual world today offers a lot of opportunities for, uh, I would say, extremist groups. But uh, I think. There is a great deal of work that has been done, at least to protect uh, strategic infrastructure of the government in terms of uh, cyber attacks. Now, 
It's a society that is at the heart of, the, of, of, the, of our thinking. And I mean that after 9-11, what we noticed is there is a huge demand for uh, new ideologies, uh, extremist ideologies. It's not a matter of supply, it's a matter of demand. So what we've done in, in our strategy fighting against extremism is that we try to put a lot of information in the virtual world so that when you Google looking for information about, for instance, for Islam, you, you will end up having more information about the moderate Islam than the extremist Islam. Good. Right. Who else? I, we've got 10 minutes to run, so possession of the microphone is critical in all of this. Get the microphone to somebody, please. Thank you. So be quite brief in your, in your, response, in your Nick, uh, question, Nick, please. This young lady has had that microphone I'm from the very you. outside. I'm coming to you. There are others as well. I have forgotten you. I can't have everyone speaking at once. Thank you. My name is Victor Borges, and I come from Cape Verde. And Cape Verde is an interesting place to look at the Atlantic because it's just in the middle, in between South America, Africa, United States, and Europe. But uh, my first comment, and I just do not have a please. question, is I listen a lot of people thinking about Sub-Saharan Africa. The last panel also spoke a lot about Sub-Saharan -Sub Africa, and yet we do not hear voice from Africa speaking out to their mind. This is a huge challenge because we cannot go on thinking and articulating interesting things for Africa. And we must involve Africans in this debate and not ask them afterwards just to consume concepts and new ideas, and we call it new challenge, etc., etc. All right, I the think first, that's taken. The second comment is, whose perspective was it? When we deal with security issues, but when you deal with, uh, with uh, trade, economic development, the question raised by Alfredo Valadão, it's also a question real in the security issues. Who will get the fillet? Because the perspective of security from an individual country or a regional entities in Africa cannot be the same as United States, Europe, etc. So when I remember discussing with the officials of European Union and uh, European neighborhood policy is eastward uh, uh, entrenched by four Cold War values uh, and war, Cold War. And I used to say to them, you need, and I used to use this French expression, to boucle the boucle, you need, vous avez besoin de boucler la boucle. So buckle you need buckle. to look at the Atlantic. But it is an almost right. uh, uh, impossible exercise to make them think out of the box. Anyone want to comment on that? Right, okay, Let, it will, we've, we've logged it, please. The quirk of, of um, the real anxiety for us in the uh, Eastern Caribbean is a quirk of geography, which sees us located between the largest drug producers in the world and the largest markets for those drugs. Following the movement of drugs through the archipelago of the Eastern Caribbean, drugs which we neither have the money to consume nor produce, have come arms, usually from North America, which we do not produce. There is a human consequence to all of that. The drugs have come, followed by the guns. Our young people are dying. And really and truly, there are very few alternatives for the development of this region when foreign direct investment ceases, tourism ceases, and all of those so things. So do you have a particular question? So the, the, the question is, where is the Caribbean in all of this? Um, what has been done to stem the flow of drugs to use these islands as transit points, um, to, to stem the movement of arms, and to link the development of the region to the WTO and trade and I think we've partially organized, that has partially been, uh, been answered. Would you like to add anything to this critical question? General? Oh. I would probably just add that the biggest challenge that we face in addressing that very prescient issue, which some of us all have sort of already taken a stab at, is that Today's paradigms need to be revised because um, the biggest challenge is that as long as 
the demand for drugs remains completely uh, uh, inelastic and the supply for drugs is completely elastic by focusing on supply, which is the, the part of the equation where the Caribbean comes in, the only thing that you're doing is adding incentives for new players to come into the market and you more or less maintain prices level. So I, I think that the big, the long-term response for that is that we have to revisit the paradigms. We have to understand that a holistic approach needs to be developed, but I wouldn't have a silver bullet to say this is how we solve the problem. Is there a recognition of the urgency? I think certainly, Maybe not. I, I think certainly some, some countries have started to press the button, but no. Okay, over there, please. Thank you. Uh, the national control of social working, social networking media Could you introduce yourself, is please? the real question, issue. Could you introduce yourself, please? Sorry. I'm Rajendra Abhyankar from India. Um, the national control of social uh, networking media is really the issue, as the panelists have said. Uh, and this is the reason why when a film is made in the U.S., uh, nothing much is done to, do, uh, to arrest or do something against that filmmaker. But when th that film leads to riots, violence and death in the Arab world, the plea is that why don't they take the film off? So could, I, could I get is, your question, please? The question is, as an alternative and a more constructive way, other than intelligence sharing and policing by Google, can we not think of an international code of conduct on the use of social networking media? This doesn't okay. have to be mandatory. We all know what's, what's happened because of this amateur film, but, any, but quickly, is there anything? This is not just about the Atlantic Basin, of course. General, would you like to have a stab at that, given you, you still have to think about the cyber threat? Well, you asked a question earlier, are you, of the minister, are you, are you happy with the greater access or are you concerned about uh, the vulnerabilities? And the answer is, it, it's not optional. You have, to, you have to open the internet. That is the only way uh, to proceed. Uh, and, and, and with that opening uh, and the connectivity that that brings, it certainly does bring vulnerabilities in a sinister way in terms of of attacks on networks that can certainly be, be of great concern, uh, but it also uh, brings the risk of content, such as this uh, very disgusting, uh, reprehensible video that is out. I, I don't know how you, you know, who's the adjudicating panel that says this is okay and that's not. That's a very dangerous path, I think. But you have to be concerned because it affects the stability of countries. That's well, uh, uh, certainly, all, uh, because of the, the very real threat of what, uh, of, of what a cyber attack could do to, to governmental or business or uh, civil society uh, networks. That's a concern. Right. I have three minutes and I have two, two people with microphones, so at least you'll get your comment heard, if, if not answered. I'm Alcides Costa Vaz from the University of Brasilia, Brazil. Uh, given that uh, it's common sense that intelligence sharing is crucial, to fight transnational organized crime across the Atlantic. And the fact that it's carried out bilaterally, and it's also restricted by uh, asymmetries in capabilities in these areas and the lack of mutual confidence very often. Given these circumstances, what, in your opinion, would be the proper framework to address these issues at the present? Yes, because there's another point here from Nicaro Russo Perez about what to do when the chain of production is divided among so many different countries. David, would you like to just have a final word quickly, please? I want to ask uh, General Ham uh, in particular, but perhaps others on the panel. AFRICOM, the organization that you head, is relatively new. Um, and we have heard yesterday and today that uh, in Africa, uh, in Latin America, there is concern about militarization of problems, and especially U.S. militarization of problems. Uh, it's always been said that one reason AFRICOM is based in Stuttgart is because some of the countries where you might like to base in Africa aren't really sure they'd be comfortable having you there. The U.S. military isn't a social networking organization. It's not a development organization. It's a military. So I'd just like to ask you, what is it that you want AFRICOM to do as a military organization to deal with these problems, and maybe I could ask Ambassador Surikhan, Dave. what is it that people in these regions would like to see U.S. military force do uh, that's not going to be threatening but be helpful? Because of the lunch arrangements, Craig has already threatened me with what might happen to me if this goes on too long. But is there a quick answer you can give to that, General? 
Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, the, the headquarters is where it is because of practical reasons. When, the, when, when we split apart, when we were birthed from United States European Command, we were in Stuttgart, made a lot of sense to stay in Stuttgart, and right now in a financial environment that we're to pay the lots and lots of money it would take to relocate and build a new headquarters someplace, Stuttgart's a good place. Um, in, in, in simple terms, what we seek to do is to help contribute to, to regional security uh, by helping to strengthen the defense capabilities of African states and of African regional organizations. You've heard the phrase often, uh, African solutions to African challenges. We think there's a, a security and military component to that that is always, always best led uh, by Africans. Somalia is a great example where it is Africans who are conducting it. We do some enabling functions in terms of training, equipping, and, and advice, but, but that, I think, is a good model for us. General, thank you, and thank you to you all. Uh, Craig, the floor is yours. I think we've highlighted how there are a, a very high level of anxieties. We've just touched the top of the, the problems. Uh, I had about 25 emails, which, is, which shows uh, how much you are happy to intervene when uh, the panelists are speaking. Thank you. And thank you, Nick.